Let's have a look at this. As, as is usually the case when someone asks me a question, no one asks me a question about 20A or B or C. No, of course not. Let's go straight for the hard part. So what I'm going to do is, most of this, this question is quite pedestrian, so I'm going to sort of skip over it a little bit. But I will talk to you because you obviously need to understand the earlier parts to even like recognize why the last part is a, is a question at all. Okay? So let's have a look. Question 20, consider the function, I'll zoom in a little bit for you. Consider this function a sixth of x squared minus 4x plus 24. You recognize what kind of shape this is. They even tell you right off the bat, it's a parabola. So the first part is, can you tell me what it looks like? Okay. So just in case you don't have it in your head, here we go. There's the parabola. And the first thing you'll note about, notice about it is it has no x in the set. And the reason why is because... It's, it's positive definite. I mean, there's lots of ways to see that, but you can immediately notice, like, one of the ways you can look at something and say, wait, something's going to be up here. See how you're adding 24 to that, right? So that, of course, with the 1 sixth, has that effect of raising you up by 4 units, right? Um, but, of course, you can just think about the numbers if that's too close for you. You say b squared is 16. 4ac is going to be... 96. So of course it's going to take off, right? Um, B squared take away 4ac will be negative, so that's why you get positive. Okay. So there it is, that's the parabola. Then we go back to the question, and it says, state the largest domain containing only positive numbers for which f of x has an inverse function, f inverse. Okay, so pause. It's a parabola. We need to think about this domain restriction because when you go to a, uh, an inverse function, what's the issue with our parabola? Why is it, it a problem? The Correct. So it fails the horizontal line test. The way you would, another um, technical way of saying this, by the way, is that this is not a one-to-one -one function. Okay. So a one-to-one -one function means for every x value, there's only y, and for every y value there's only one x, right? Now for every x, there is only one y, right? Like I can give you x equals anything, and you only, so this is the vertical line test, right? So it passes that, it's a function, but because it fails the horizontal line test, if I said to you y equals 10, well, there are two x's that will match that, right? So this is not one to one, okay? So it fails that, so we have to say, all right, what restriction would you like? And they, they say, well, I, I want the positive side. We know that we could take the left-hand half or the right-hand half. They want the right-hand half. Okay. So you basically have to come back to your graph um, and say, if I zoom in a little bit, you'll see the scale. Yeah, that'll be far enough. So you can see, and you can verify this using calculus, or because it's a parabola, you just find the vertex using the axis of symmetry. Um, there's x equals 5, you go 4, 3, 2, x equals 2 is your axis of symmetry, okay? So therefore, x is greater than or equal to 2, that's the domain I'm interested in, okay? That'll give me an inverse. Okay, so then it says, sketch f inverse on your diagram from part A and state its domain, okay? Now I'm going to do a bit of a, a hack here, and I want you guys to be able to follow along with me. So if you have a computer there, you're welcome to do this. You can see... Like, if I have a, a function norm, right? Like, if I gave you this. Um, this one I've had a look at a few times. I can do, I can work out what the inverse is just by algebra, right? I can say, well, in order to get the inverse, I'm going to swap my inputs and outputs, my x's and my y's, like so. And then I just do my usual thing to make x the, make y the subject, I should say. Okay? So then you go through, and that's fine. Now, when you have a look at this guy, you could of course go through the whole process, but it's a bit of waste to have to think about like what it looks like. They don't at any point ask you to find the equation of this thing. They just say, well, can you tell me where it is on your graph? Now, all I've done here, you can see this is the first step, right? You see I've swapped my inputs and outputs. So of course, if I graph this, there's my, why is it square? Not square, there we go. There's my um, sideways parabola. Okay. But of course, that's not f inverse, because that's not a function, so it can't be an inverse function. So what do I have to do to this? And you can follow the Yeah, now, just be careful. I want to restrict the domain on this guy, the orange graph, which means I need to restrict the range, range of the inverse function. Okay? So you guys just told me x is greater than 2 is my original domain restriction. So that corresponds to a range restriction of 
why is why, why, why is greater than restriction? So let's let's go ahead and put that in. So I don't know if you know how to put um, restrictions in Desmos yet. So let me show you. Um, if you go down to the uh, bottom left hand corner and open up this alphabetical keyboard, like you guys have noticed, I, I do this all the time. Like that's not just because I like curly braces, even though I do. It's because curly braces are our convention for stating domains or um, ranges. So if you pop the curly braces in. Okay. And then you come back to your original keyboard. What did you say the range restriction was again? Y is greater than or equal to two. Bam, there it is. And of course, um, so you can see what I've typed in over there. That's the whole thing. And you can see the restriction that's resulted. Okay. So that's good. So far, so good. I'm going to come back to the original question now. I've sketched it. Can you tell me the domain? How, how, you don't have to tell, tell me the value necessarily, but how am I going to find it? Let's have a look. This is domain now I'm interested in, right? You remember I got the range restriction by looking at the domain restriction of this guy that I wanted. So how will I find the domain of this? Yeah, I'm going to find the range of the original guy, which is whatever, whatever that is. I would have said y is greater than that. For this, I'm going to say x is greater than that. Okay. Yeah. I'm not like if you grab it for your hand not with like a computer, how do you know that there's an intersection there? If you graph it freehand, it's obviously going to be a lot yeah. more difficult, okay? So I'm sort of taking advantage of the fact that this is there. Um, I'm just thinking, I don't think it's instrumental to the question, in this case, whether there is um, intercepts or not. Um, oh, my battery. Um, I could, of course, say y equals x, and because there's a solution to, if I hide this guy again, because there are two solutions between y equals x and this guy, right? The places where those two intersect is the same place where your inverse function so and is going to intersect. But I, it's a sketch. Then if I need to draw it, so I need to find the y equals x, the two values, and then do. Correct. So if, if the original question was, like you have a look at this question, right? Um, Clearly, like they're trying to get to this, right? So they're not that worried about, like, do you get the f inverse exactly right, okay? But were the question to terminate here, and like, no, this is the whole thing, and I want these two at the same time, then it is, that's probably an important feature. I want to know where they intersect. I think they ask for intersections. Okay, come on, there you go. So let's go ahead. Uh, you can see, and interestingly, I don't think it's going to end up affecting, at least for me, the way I did this. So how are you going to do this? You're going to solve. This equals this, and you'll get your two values. Yeah. So is that always the rule? Which rule? Um, that like the inverse and the original will only ever intersect on the y equals x, so that's all we have to solve for. Because that's the thing I got caught on. Yeah. Because okay. I tried to inverse, and it was all ugly. And okay. So the short that answer, is, the short answer is yes, and I want you to figure out geometrically why. Okay. Um, the whole idea of going from a function to its inverse, geometrically, this is where we began before any of the algebra stuff, right? Was to take the reflection across y equals x and go like that. Okay? And that's why you turn your heads and you can see the symmetry, right? So therefore it stands to reason, if there's a point that is I'll take this way again. If there is a point that is on my line of reflection itself. That when I, then when I reflect it, it's going to stay exactly where it is. Okay? So therefore, where is the inverse going to be for the original function here? And the answer is still here, because I reflect it and it doesn't take me anywhere. Okay? Whereas if I'm off of my y equals x line, you reflect this guy, he comes over here. You reflect uh, this guy, he comes over here. Right? But when you reflect something that's on the line itself, you stay put. Does that make sense? Yeah. So therefore, like, and this is part of the point of me highlighting, like, don't, don't go ahead and do the algebra of this, right? You should be doing the algebra of solve for this equals that yeah. problem. Okay. But can it ever intersect, like, not on the line? Mm. I don't think so. I don't think so. I was trying to understand it, and then I read math forums, and they were like, oh, but sometimes it can be, like, different variations of y equals negative x, and then, like, I was really confused. What you probably are thinking of is, um, yeah, okay, this is actually the question the key to asked me before. Um, sometimes, depending on, you know how with the trig function that we've been looking at, like there's this periodicity, so you get copies and copies and copies. So if you are solving something like, do you remember when we did um, y equals cos inverse of cos x, right? And you're like, oh, it's this weird, like, bumpy thing, okay? 
okay? That weird bumpy thing is actually like different graphs and we've just done domain restrictions. So we get this portion here and then this portion here and this portion here. If you take away all of the restrictions, right? Instead of saying, oh, okay, let's do um, because, yeah. Instead of getting just these parts, right? If I take away all the restrictions, which is exactly what happens if you do something like this. Okay, no more restrictions. X and Y, they, they're variables. They can change and go anywhere they like, right? Suddenly, this line doesn't just start here and stop there. It just goes like that. And so does this one. And so does every other one. In fact, what you end up getting is this kind of isometric grid, and they just sort of go on forever. Okay? So if I then go ahead and take the inverse of that thing, the inverse of this thing, right? Number one, gross. Number two, outside the course. Number three, there's a whole bunch of points on here that aren't y equals x, that when I take the inverse, which is put in my y equals x line and then reflect, that's going to intersect with the original. That's partly because the original is like everywhere. Like I was just saying, okay, this looks like something Brendan cooked up in his spare time, right? <laughs> but it, it'll, it'll intersect with itself. Its function will intersect with its inverse on places that aren't y equals x. That's not a function. Well, no, exactly right. That's, that's exactly my point, which is why it's outside of the scope because we didn't look at those kinds of Okay, so all functions will only, for functions, this is that. Correct. Okay. That's right. Okay. Uh, okay. If you're talking about inverse relations, that's another. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank okay. you.